Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Yuri Tromhani, and I'm going to be the chair for uh, this morning tutorial. And we're going to begin with uh, Ludovic Joubert. He's going to teach us about um, classical quantum, uh, sorry, classical Monte Carlo simulations in frustrated systems. No quantum, right? Just yes. classical. Okay. Perfect. OK, very good. Can you hear me? Yes, I think it seems to be working. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here today with us this morning. Uh, for people present here and for people online. So as Judith was, uh, was saying, I am going to tell you a story about Monte Carlo simulations. So uh, it will be a, with a bit of a long introduction and then going to more, a bit more technical details along the way. The goal is of this lecture will be to give you a few examples of techniques, of classical Monte Carlo techniques to study especially frustrated magnets. So, uh, in particular, I will focus on frustrated magnet because that's the goal of this uh, purpose of this uh, conference, uh, which means I will not spend uh, time or much time on like uh, some of the cluster algorithms, which are more uh, focused and dedicated to critical phenomena, which is usually not the main focus of what we are doing here in uh, frustrated magnets. Uh, and as usual, feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. I will try to answer, and will answer to the best of my uh, null, uh, capacity. So, first, a very general introduction. So, as you see here on my slides, I'm talking about two body problems. So, it's just a general way. I mean, as physicists, we are trying to look, for example, at uh, uh, mechanics of uh, of uh, uh, mechanics of body. And if you remember, I mean, depending on where you're coming from, either in high school or in college or maybe in kindergarten, I don't know, uh, you learn about the two body problems like about a planet and the sun and earth. And at the beginning, when, you're, I mean, when you start learning about that, uh, there's all of these fun facts about like geometrical, geometrical constraints and uh, Kepler laws and so on, that allows us to uh, understand the behavior of planets and of, uh, of stars. But quite quickly, we realize that actually two body problems is very simple. I mean, it can be solved exactly. We know all of the solutions, but it's very simple. And already, when we try to switch to free body problems, it's becoming much more complicated. So this has been studied for centuries. I mean, there was a lot of effort in the 19th century and also in the 20th. I mean, uh, just checking in, uh, recently, I mean, even like a, a couple of years ago, people have used like neural networks to try to solve the free body problems numerically. The reason for that is because already with free particles, just free particles, and uh, gravitational interaction between them, the system is usually chaotic. So here I'm giving you an example which is not chaotic. So it's a, a stable solution. It's very weakly stable, but it is stable, which means that maybe somewhere in the universe there are three planets or three stars which are behaving this way and are really orbiting, uh, forming an eight in the universe together. But my point here is to say that already with your, when you have three particles, three uh, interacting to each other, that's already very complicated and we can in most cases, we cannot have exact solutions or they are extremely mathematically difficult to obtain. Uh, now, as you know, when we start to consider n-body particles, uh, like uh, several, partic several planets and sun together, that's already becoming very challenging. And then you have to resort to some uh, numerical calculations or some approximations and so on. But the thing is, if we are here today, it's because we are not studying planets or suns, we are studying uh, condensed matter, in particular, frustrated magnetism. And so our everyday life, it's not about planets, it's about studying not the uh, infinitely large, but the infinitely small, and the behavior of atoms in this crystal. And so the kind of questions we have to answer are this, like we consider a complicated uh, lattice in 2D or in three dimensions. We add like complicated interactions, Heisenberg, anisotropy, Yoskimoria, and so on, or long range dipolar interactions. Sometimes we have impurities, sometimes we have a magnetic field. And all of them are competing and they are not happy to be together. And when you get all of this, at the end of the day, you have to look for the dynamics and see how they move together. That's actually very challenging. It's not possible to solve it exactly. I mean, except in some very rare cases like Kitayev, which we have seen. In most cases, it's not possible. And so the, and so the question is, uh, what kind of method can we use to study that? And the, uh, yeah. And, that's usually because I like that. Uh, and so the, and, and this is why we need uh, different techniques. So analytically, we need to be able to manage many different approximations. 
like uh, uh, some field, uh, field theory, mean field theory, so some gauge field uh, theory and so on. Uh, and numerically, they have, there is a plethora of numerical techniques to study these models with uh, variation of approximations. And the reason I'm talking about that is because one of the strong suit of Monte Carlo simulations, and why you are here, why you should be listening to this lecture today, is especially the versatility, versatility, yes, of models that we can study. So the point is, all of these different interactions, as anisotropic as you want, long range, with impurities, uh, and so on, the, with the magnetic field or not, they can be studied uh, straightforwardly with Monte Carlo. This is not an approximation, so if you manage to get, uh, so I will talk about the, uh, uh, the uh, disadvantages in, a, in an instant, but most of the time it gives you the correct result, which means it is not a mean field approximation, the critical exponents are not going to be mean field. If you manage to get big enough system size and so on, you will get the proper exponent of the uh, first conditions. You, you can get order by disorder, which is a very subtle, complicated phenomena, but you can get it naturally in Monte Carlo simulations. You can measure whatever you want, because the point is, uh, during a Monte Carlo simulation, at any time, you have a snapshot of the spin configuration. So you can just look uh, which spin, uh, any spin you want, at any time you want. And you can compute whatever, any kind of order parameter, specific it, or anything which is exponentially uh, relevant. You can reach large system size, so it's not limited to small ones, you can get uh, large ones. And uh, we forget that quite often, it's done naturally at finite temperature, and experiments are always done at finite temperature. So you get the temperature uh, immediately with this. Now there is one last point that I want to uh, emphasize, it's Monte Carlo helps you to build an intuition, because since you can do all of this, at the end of the day, you can, you have a, you can have build a very good, strong intuition of the model you are studying. Now, of course, there are drawbacks. The main one is that it's not quantum. I mean, you have quantum Monte Carlo, of course, but then you hit the problem of sign problem and so on, which is famous for frustrated systems. Uh, but it is, um, so it is not quantum. So you have no entanglement, no Bose-Einstein condensate, even if you can sometimes trick with that. Uh, and the other issue is thermalization. If you see Monte Carlo as a numerical experiment, then uh, as an experiment, you can have problems of uh, thermalization of your system. And that, and so the system may fall out of equilibrium. So what I'm going to tell you today is about different techniques and improvements you can use to try to solve these problems of thermalization and to have a well thermalized Monte Carlo. Uh, so now the one, uh, I mean, you might ask, if indeed classical Monte Carlo simulations have no quantum fluctuations, you cannot study quantum systems. Uh, and the problem is, in, in matter, in real life, almost everything is quantum. I mean, to a large extent, you always have some quantum fluctuations, some quantum coherence. So does it really make sense to study classical systems? Well, the best way to show it is by, exp by uh, examples. So this is, so here I'm going to show you a few examples. I'm not going to go into the details of these materials or the techniques, not yet, but just to show you the, uh, what you can do with classical Monte Carlo. So this is a neutron scattering experiments on erbium titanium materials. And when you uh, simulate this material at finite temperature, you get this structure factor, which is very close, as you can see, from the one you obtain uh, exponentially. Now, one thing to keep in mind, as you see, it's T over TC is 1.22. And that's a general feature that when you try to compare classical Monte Carlo to experiments, almost always you have a shift of the temperatures, like the temperature in experiments, transition temperature experiments might be different from the one in your simulations, and so you need to rescale them. Uh, and so that's what we, we do there. But once you do this rescaling, you have a very good match between these. So this is also the same for ethobium titanate, for another frustrated power core system, where you have the main features that you can see in the scattering of neutron scattering experiments, you can reproduce them in simulations. Uh, a more uh, basic but important question is what happens when you have strong complicated Hamiltonian? So, for example, tabium titanate in a 110 field, they found this kind of long range order in it, which can be seen as kind of double layers of topological charges. So, uh, it's, it's a complicated one. There, people had no idea where it was coming from. And the thing is, when you include magnetoelectric effect, as Carlo was talking about on, on Monday, and when, when you include that, in the Monte Carlo simulations, you can do interactions between dipolar, electric dipolar dipoles, between magnetic dipoles, 
we can add nearest neighbor exchange, and when you do all of that in the simulations, you get this long range order, and you can explain the long range order observed in Tabium Tatenite. So, so far, I've been telling you examples of power rare earth power core systems. So, of course, it's also valid for uh, uh, other systems, like here it's a triangular system, where you compare experiments to Monte Carlo simulations with uh, very good success to explain the, the scattering. And it's not only applicable to rare earth materials, but also like in these metal organic frameworks, which is based on manganese ions, which is not rare earth ion, you can also nicely reproduce the susceptibility, which is the black data, with Monte Carlo simulations, which are the orange data here. Uh, now, all of this was at equilibrium, but the thing is, it's also valid uh, for the dynamics. You can also calculate compute dynamical uh, quantities with Monte Carlo simulations. So here, these are experiments of inelastic neutron scattering compared to linear spin waves and compared to uh, Monte Carlo molecular dynamics of Monte Carlo simulations. And you see that they all match each other very nicely. So I'm showing this because this is a spin one. Nickel is a spin one in this case. So even for spin one, which is supposed to be quite quantum, you have a very good comparison between classical simulations and semi-classical dynamics and linear spin wave, which is quantum to linear order, and experiments here. So which means that with a little bit of trick, you can still get some degree, at least to linear order, of quantum fluctuations with classical Monte Carlo simulations. Yes? Uh, no, the, in the previous one, actually, they were all Heisenberg spins, Heisenberg systems. Uh, in this uh, dynamics where you're talking about, uh, what's the, how to define time in Monte Carlo? Uh, so that's the thing. You do, in this case, it's not Monte Carlo time, it's molecular dynamics. So if I have time, I will talk about it at the end of this lecture, but it's actually real time. Uh, so it's not the stochastic time of Monte Carlo, it's a real time uh, based, on non, uh, based on block uh, equations. Yes? Do you have what? Temperature. Temperature. So in this case, yes, because what happens here is that you do classical Monte Carlo simulations at finite temperatures. You get these spin configurations as initial seeds, and then you do a Runge-Kutta method for the dynamics. And so because the initial seeds are thermalized at finite temperature, these results are at finite temperature, and you can do that for any time of temperatures. Yeah, Carlo? Yes, it works. So uh, when when you do classical Monte Carlo, I assume that it, it, you have spins, well deformed, yeah. well well formed spins, and it can describe very likely magnetic ordered states. Yeah. So when you do dynamics, you get the say the the dynamics or spin waves of ordered magnet. But can you also get excitation spectra of say spin liquids, disordered systems? Absolutely, yes. So that's the advantage of this method, that it's essentially not related to spin waves or to any linear approximations. It includes all of the nonlinear terms and for any kind of, of state, because you start with seeds coming from classical Monte Carlo, so they can be any kind of spin configurations. They can be ordered or they can be disordered, they can be a spin liquid. And then you run the, uh, you use the block, uh, block equations for the semi-classical dynamics uh, and then you, you can get these features for any kind of systems, disordered, spin liquid or long range ordered, or pneumatic. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, please continue to ask questions, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And I will continue, but uh, interrupt me anytime you want. Uh, so, this is, uh, so this is an example for spin one uh, on power claw again. This is a similar example uh, for a spin. I think this one is spin one half. Uh, I think this one is spin one half, so it's very quantum. But here again, so neutron scattering data are, are very difficult to measure in this one. But you can see that again, uh, Monte Carlo classical results compare very well with linear spin wave theory, so quantum to linear order, and compare reasonably well up to the precision that you can get in experiments. But again, they are very challenging experiments to do here. Uh, to compare very well with experimental data. And this is for power cross spin one, this is for bilayer breathing Kagome system spin one half. So very quantum and still classical Monte Carlo works pretty well. 
then there is this paper which was published recently and that uh, people here in the audience know better than me, uh, which studied a, a classical Kagome systems and where they find at low temperature uh, using NMR and uh, T1 measurements, they find a linear behavior in T1, which was expected from semi-classical dynamics uh, on the Kagome systems here. So that's, that's a very nice paper uh, that was published last year. And actually coming back to your question, all of these were with continuous classical spins. Uh, and here we have simulations for ising spins. So that's spin ice. This one is spin ice materials. And here, the stochastic dynamics of Monte Carlo, so it's really stochastic, uh, matches very well the magnetic relaxation that is observed experimentally in, in, uh, in this present unit. So this data here is coming from crystal field uh, terms, which can be explained uh, by using single ion uh, anisotropy. But the uh, collective behavior of spins is coming from this. And you can see this is very well reproduced by simple classical Monte Carlo, even here with stochastic dynamics. So not even real-time dynamics, but just stochastic one. And it can, we can go even uh, further with uh, PSD measurements, so which is also some form of dynamics at a given frequency. And the color data are exponential data, and the black curves are fit from simulations. And they fit very well for all, a whole range of temperature, again, with stochastic dynamics. So all of this was done with classical Monte Carlo simulations, and now I'm going to explain you uh, how to do that. Uh, but first, uh, a few books. These are, I mean, essentially, if you use these three books, you can get a, more or less everything you want to know about Monte Carlo, classical Monte Carlo. My favorite one is this one in the middle for spin systems, but Newman and Barkema, it's a very good one. And if you combine it with the book of Landau and Binder, you have essentially everything you, everything you want. Uh, this one by Werner Kraut is less applied to spin systems. Uh, so it's more like a hard disk simulation and so on. But it's very good if you want to get to know about the philosophy of Monte Carlo. He spends a lot of time explaining about decorrelation and so on. And this is, uh, I mean, if you want to get an intuition, general intuition about Monte Carlo simulations, that's a very nice book. Uh, just one comment. When you look for Monte Carlo Landau on Google, you find uh, Chevrolet. I mean, it's not the book, so just so you know. So. Basic example, something that most of you have probably already seen. Take a circle uh, and try to, and you want to calculate the area of a circle. So I suspect most of you have seen it. I just want to use it as a basic introduction to why Monte Carlo is, uh, uh, is interesting and what is the philosophy behind. Uh, you know that, I, I'm supposed to have something here. Well, this was the, this was the formula so I'm sorry for people online. This is just the formula of uh, to get uh, the number of the number of pi that was supposed to be here there on top of central limit theorem. So it is a very standard one. So it's just you take you you know the area of a circle is uh, pi r squared. So here it's one quarter of a circle, so it's pi over four. You know the area of a square is one because the side are one. And so if you throw a lot of uh, random points on it, and you compute how many points are in the red area over the total number of points, you get a measurement of the area of the circle. And by doing this, you can calculate pi to a, a reasonable approximation, as you can see here. Uh, now, uh, central limit theorem tells you that the relative error grows like one over square root of n. So the more points you get, the uh, more precise the answer is, but it only grows like the error only diminishes one over square root of n. And for a 2D system like this, it's not very interesting, to be honest, it's not very efficient. But uh, if you have a, like a 20 dimensional integral, like if you want to, inter to integrate something in 20 dimensions or even more, uh, then Monte Carlo becomes especially good for this multi kind of multi-dimensional integration. And that's frequently used in high energy physics, in particle physics. But my point here by showing this example is just uh, forget for a minute, uh, forget about uh, physics, forget about mathematics, and just imagine that you are in a universe that is square like this. You don't even know the units. You don't even know it's size one uh, or anything. You don't even know numbers. You just know that your universe is square and that you have two countries, the red one and the blue one. No, you don't know anything, math, numbers, anything, but you have a perfect random number generator. And so what you do is you just do that. Even without knowing anything, you can just do that. 
and immediately you will know the ratio between the, 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 two, uh, the two countries. And you will be able to compare the area between the two countries, even without using mathematics or anything. And that's the power and the usefulness of Monte Carlo. So that's what I put here. At the beginning, you set the rules. Here, the rules are very simple. It's a square universe. You have two countries, red and blue. Let randomness do the job. And you just look if your random number generator is in the red region or in the blue region. And after that, you analyze. And by counting, actually, no, you need to be able to count. So you need to know uh, numbers like one, two, three, four. But that's all. Uh, you count this number of, uh, uh, of points, and you get the area automatically. So that's, uh, that's the usefulness. And that's uh, basically what we do with Monte Carlo all the time. And I want to insist on this part, analyze, because that's, basically, that's, that's a fun part. That's what makes us physicists, which is we have, a, we have a model. We let randomness do the job. And then at the end, we analyze the data. And of course, then you have a feedback loop where once you have analyzed the data, usually you come back and you set new rules. Like you modify a bit the parameters. You have a, a little bit less of the area. You have a little bit more of dipolar interactions and stuff like that. OK. Now, a little bit of history. You, uh, you might know these names, like Metropolis. And so these are the people that are the beginning of uh, Monte Carlo simulations. As you can see from the black and white, the, it's not new. It's not recent. Uh, so the first paper with Monte Carlo uh, in it was from 1949 by Metropolis and Ulam, which are these two gentlemen here. And here at the beginning, it was not really about simulations, more about using randomness in computers. And it was essentially, especially about uh, like uh, uh, integrals. Like here, they especially give the example of 20-dimensional uh, integrals because they, we, they needed that to calculate the uh, calculation, enfin, to make calculations at Los Alamos uh, for neutron scattering, uh, for neutron radiation, actually. Uh, but then a few years later, these people, which are here, uh, gave, uh, used that to make a simulation of uh, Monte Carlo. So they used randomness to make the first Monte Carlo simulations. And I should say that so Metropolis is the first author, and people usually know Metropolis for the algorithm Metropolis. Uh, but apparently, so there is some controversy. I mean, I don't know what is true or not. I mean, the controversy came like literally 50 years after this paper, so it's difficult to know what is true or not. But apparently, Metropolis, uh, he's a guy who was building the computer. So building the computer was really state of the art engineering at the time, but he was not necessarily really involved into the Monte Carlo uh, calculation simulations. So the people who derived the physics of the Monte Carlo simulations seems to be these four people here. And in particular, the first people who have uh, coded Monte Carlo simulations are Ariana Rosenbluth and Augusta Thaler. So I think these two people are basically the first one to have ever done a Monte Carlo code uh, in history. So that, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, and by the way, as you can see, it has been slightly cited. So I mean, when you when you paper which is that point, I mean, I, I pay you a beer, promise, or, or any kind of uh, beverage you want. Tea is good also. Um, so, uh, in particular, in two thousand, so about this paper, which is the first paper about Monte Carlo simulations, uh, they were studying like uh, liquid solid phase transitions in two dimensions. Uh, so Rosenbluth, who is one of the authors, said in two thousand three that. Uh, one of the crucial ideas was to take ensemble average instead of following detailed kinematics. So I want you to step back and to go back to the 50s. Okay, we're in the 50s. Computers are a brand new thing. I mean, before that, it was experiments or pen and paper calculations. Okay, and now computers arrive. And for the first time, people are trying to think about simulating uh, experiments, simulating real life. So when you do that, when you have never done that before, the first thing you think to do is really being as close as possible from experiments. And so that's why people at first thought about, the, about kinematics. Like you see a particle, you want to be able to follow the particle and you let it move like Brownian motion. And then you take snapshots and you see when, uh, when you get to the data you get and you analyze this data. But actually the thing with Monte Carlo simulations is that you don't have to follow the movement of a particle. You can just take an ensemble of particles and that's what matters. You can make an average of an ensemble of independent configurations, and you don't have to follow uh, the dynamics of a, of, a, of a system, it being a particle or spin systems or anything. And these are two very uh, important distinctions, which is ensemble average over time average. 
So StatMec tells us that when you are at equilibrium, the two are equivalent. In experiments, you, you don't usually, I mean, it depends, but you don't usually have access to the ensemble average, but in simulations, you do. And so that was this big step, which was done uh, something like uh, 70 years ago, which was to simulate not real system, so not the dynamics of the system, but to try to be, or to optimize the measurement of ensemble average. And then coming from that, the point was, uh, everything is uh, summarized in this sentence. Instead of choosing configurations randomly, then weighting them with, with a Boltzmann factor, we choose configurations with a probability of the Boltzmann factor and weight them evenly. So that's a key point because choosing configuration randomly can take a long time. I mean, if you have n spins, it will take the n, n random numbers. And then in the end, you calculate the energy and the energy might be very high. And so it might have a very small Boltzmann factor. And so this is a very inefficient way to uh, uh, simulate a system. But on the other hand, if you have an efficient way to choose the configurations with a good Boltzmann number and to then to weight them evenly, that would be much, much more efficient. And so, that, but that means you need to have a way to be able to go from configurations to configurations, which uh, respect this, uh, this Boltzmann factor at a given temperature. And so which are the most probable ones, the most probable configurations at a given temperature. And that's the whole point of Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so now Monte Carlo, uh, this was, a, as I said, a lengthy introduction, but what is Monte Carlo simulations? Let's take the master equation. So master equation, WI, that's the weight of a state. So here, I and J, and throughout most of my talk, I think all, if I didn't mistake, I and J, they're not spins, they're not sites, they are two different states, okay? So this is a spin configuration, and this is a spin configuration. I mean, uh, I is a spin configuration, and J is a spin configuration. So for example, uh, for the people online, I'm going to, to explain what, I mean, it's a very small drawing. If you take two spins, you have four states. One with spin, two spins pointing up, another one with spin up and spin down, another one with spin down and spin up, another one with two spin down. So these, if you have two spins, you have four, four states, and I and J represent each one of these states. For example, this is, I is two spin up and J is uh, up and down, for example. And then when you uh, want to study the, the dynamics uh, of, this, uh, of this system, you take the probability, so the weight of state J at a given time T, all of this is a given time T, you take the weight, uh, so the, the probability of, uh, the weight of a state J, and with the probability to go from J to I. And this will add weight to your state I because you are going from J to I. And on the, other, on the opposite, if you take the weight of state I and you look at the probability to go from I to J, this will tell you uh, how much weight you will lose with time. So this is the weight coming from all other states to your state I, and this is the weight coming from state I to all of the other ones. So this is entering state I, this is exiting state I, okay? This is the master equation. Uh, so first, Monte Carlo simulations is a Markov process. There is no memory. So all of this is at time t. If there was like a time t minus delta t and so on, or t plus delta t, you will have some memory effect, but here you don't. And uh, uh, just for definitions, I will talk about transition, transition rate, and that's Aij, which is essentially these terms. So uh, the probability to go from, site I, from state i to j times the weight of state i. So, the weight is essentially the Boltzmann factor. You can see that exponential of minus beta energy of state i, okay? Uh, that's almost always uh, correct. So that's a transition weight. Now, what we want to do is that we want to do simulations at equilibrium. So that's a strong point because there are many way, many times when you actually want to do things out of equilibrium, but here we will focus about what happens at equilibrium. And even, we'll, even for the dynamics, we consider the dynamics at equilibrium, okay? And so because we are at equilibrium, we don't want to have any variations of the weight with time. We, you, we might have some transition time, but once we have reached equilibrium, this is equal to zero. And so which means that the right part of this equation is equal to zero. And this is how you solve Monte Carlo simulations. You take this right part and you impose detailed balance. 
So for each state j, for each pair of state j and i, you make these two terms equals. So the transition rate from i to j equals transition rate from j to i. And that gives you this detail balance here. So you see, this is a strong constraint because you could impose this condition without imposing this constraint because this is putting, this is making everything zero for each one of these terms. While what you want at the end is to have the whole sum equals to zero. So there are some algorithms that break detail balance but respect the global balance here. I'm not going to talk about these systems here in this, in this lecture, but it is possible. Here, I will always consider simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, where detail balance is imposed. And that is, you see, with a red box written in red and so on, this is very important. This is the key point of Monte Carlo simulations uh, for almost all of the simulations that you will ever see. That's very rare when it's not the case. For almost all of the simulations, it will, detail balance will be imposed. And if you want to understand physically what happens, you can see that, uh, say that the weight, so the Boltzmann factor, uh, the state I has a lower energy than state J, okay? That means that the Boltzmann factor of state I is higher than the Boltzmann factor of state J. So this number is bigger than one. It can be much bigger than one. And much bigger than one means that you have higher probabilities to go from J to high than the reverse. And that's what, that makes sense. If you, a state, if your given state has a lower energy, you have more probabilities from the other ones at high energy to go down to this one than vice versa at a given temperature. I mean, of course, this is a Boltzmann factor, which means if you put infinite temperature, very, very high temperature, all of these energies don't matter. And this is one, this is one, and this is one also. So at infinite temperature, you can go from I to J without wondering about the energy. But as you cool down the system, you get a difference in Boltzmann weight, and this is where you get this change of probabilities. So again, this is crucial. This is a key point of Monte Carlo simulations. This is where the physics come from. This is, it looks very simple, but this is really the point, the only thing that makes Monte Carlo simulations physical. Uh, so, you can have periodic processes, but the thing, uh, so if you have, for example, a driving force, if you have an external driving force, uh, you, um, you might have some periodicity, and then in this case, in, uh, the Monte Carlo simulations will give you something different. The Monte Carlo simulations will follow the dynamics of the system. And so the point is uh, to use enough Monte Carlo simulations at a given delta t of your dynamics to make sure that you are able to, uh, uh, to uh, measure or simulate the real physical quantity uh, with this driving force here. Uh, of course, what happens sometimes is that this driving force is very strong and then you have auto equilibrium physics. And you can still use Monte Carlo, but then Monte Carlo really explores the uh, auto equilibrium physics and the auto equilibrium dynamics. And that's a different, uh, that's a different uh, philosophy. But in most systems, so for all of the systems I showed you, uh, everything was at equilibrium and so you always had this. Okay, but that's a very good question. Uh, and so the second point, and the second important point is ergodicity. Because if you have a system which respects detail balance, but is stuck in a small region of Gibbs ensemble, you cannot explore the whole system, your system will fail because you will be biased to a small region. This, uh, in classical system, uh, it's usually less problematic. You still have to be careful, but it's usually less problematic. In quantum system, it can be dramatic because you can be stuck into a, a system without any diagonal terms allowing you to go to another part of the Hubbard space, and then you are just exploring a small fraction. But for classical simulations, uh, this is most of the time not a problem, but you have to keep it in mind. And once you have these two rules imposed, you can do Monte Carlo simulations. So this is the graph of Monte Carlo simulations. I'm going to go there step by step. You start with the initial spin configuration. Actually, it doesn't. I'm going to focus, because we are here for frustrated systems, going to focus on spin systems through the rest of this uh, lecture, okay? You take initial spin configuration. To be honest, usually, the, it, uh, depending on what you want to simulate, you might to be careful about the spin the configuration, but most of the time, it does not matter too much. Uh, let me explain uh, why. So you get Monte Carlo time t equals zero. Then you do Monte Carlo move. Uh, yeah, so Monte Carlo step, 
Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, so, Monte Carlo and n equals zero, so you initiate these two quantities, they are just two variables of your code. You choose a spin randomly, it's Ising spins, I will first consider Ising spins. You flip this spin in your system, you choose a spin randomly, you flip this spin, and you calculate the energy difference. So you see your spin is surrounded by many other spins, and by flipping it, it will create a difference of energy. This difference of energy might be positive or negative, so it might be favorable or unfavorable to do it, but you create a difference of energy. And then you uh, uh, generate a random number between 0 and 1, and you calculate the probability. This is where the detail balance uh, appears and the probability appears. The random number generator allows you to flip the spin with a given probability. Because you see, if delta E is negative, so if the final, by flipping the spin, you gain energy, this is negative, exponential of uh, something minus negative is bigger than one, and so this will always be accepted. And so you will always flip the spin and you get a new spin configuration. Now, if the final state is higher in energy, this will be positive, it will cost you energy, but still, because you do simulations at finite temperature, you have a thermal bath that is connected. You are doing simulations in the canonical ensemble for StatMech. And because of the thermal bath, you have, both, you have thermal fluctuations that will allow you, with a given probability, to flip the spin. So, depending on that, yes, you flip the spin, no, you don't. And you, uh, uh, as long as n is smaller than the total number of spins in the system, you come back and you do it again, okay? And n here, that's the total number of spins, and once you've done that n times, that's what we call a Monte Carlo step. That means that you have randomly, so because, it's, because this is random, you haven't really looked at all of the spins, but you have looked at as many spins as there are spins to the system. And that's a typical time scale of Monte Carlo simulations. So for example, when you use stochastic Monte Carlo dynamics to compare to real time, this is this time scale which is important. Because when you increase system size, uh, this one ingredient of looking at one spin, this will become more and more negligible because the system will be bigger and bigger. But if you define a Monte Carlo step with n attempts to flip a spins, this will define you something which is independent of the system size. So, uh, this is one Monte Carlo step. Then, once you have done Monte, Monte Carlo step, you check time t, which is the time of your simulations. And that's the important thing. If time t is smaller than an equilibration time, you don't look at the data. You continue to do the simulations. Once it's bigger than this equilibration time, then you compute observables, and you store data, and you continue the process. And this is the equilibration time, which allows you to get to the steady state, because you initial, imagine you do a simulations at, uh, at, uh, in a paramagnetic state, and your initial configuration has all spins up. Having all spins for, uh, for, for an anti four magnet, for example. Having all spins up for an anti four magnet costs a huge amount of energy. That's the highest energy state you can have. So if you are at low temperature, it's very unlikely that you will have this state. So this polarized state will be very unlikely. And so starting from this polarized state, you will get something that is not physical. It will give you a weight a probability that is not physical. But then if you wait long enough, up to an equilibration time, you will very quickly decorrelate all of the spins. Actually, within one Monte Carlo step, usually it happens, or a few Monte Carlo steps. You will very quickly de uh, decorrelate the spins, and you will go towards a step uh, which is uh, more, uh, more thermalized and which is more um, uh, relevant to a given temperature. So this equilibration time is important. And so typically in my simulations, uh, if I want to have reasonable data, I use one million Monte Carlo step for computation, and I use like 100,000 or 100,000 Monte Carlo step for equilibration. Now, sometimes it's more technical, it's more difficult, so you need to go longer, but that's typical of the time scale. And then once you're above this equilibration time, you compute the observables, and once you are finished your simulation, so at the total time, you average everything and you have output data. And when you do that, you get anything you want. Magnetization, structure factor, specific heat, subtibility, anything you want, you get it from that. So this is the Metropolis algorithm. Uh, and as I said before, it's really Metropolis, Rosenbluff, Rosenbluff, Steller, Taylor, but that's a different point. Uh, uh, I think, I guess most of you have seen that at some point. I just wanted to summarize all of this to make sure that everyone was on the, was on the same page. Yeah. Yes? Uh, 
that would be uh, that would so that's a good question. So what happens is that imagine that um, imagine that state uh, I has um, lower energy and has a higher energy than J. Then if state uh, I has a higher energy than J, what you will say is that Pij will be equal to one and Pji will be equal to the Boltzmann factor because this is the Boltzmann factor. This is exponential of minus beta delta E, okay? This is this. And, and so you see that you have, it's a ratio of two numbers. So you can choose the ratio, it's up, it defined up to a perfect factor, so you can choose a perfect factor. And the optimal way to define it is to say that this is one and this is, the exponential, this is a Boltzmann factor, okay? So this is indeed this ratio between the two. Uh, w is a weight of state i, which you define as uh, exponential of minus beta e i. That's, that's a Boltzmann factor, and this is the ratio of the yeah the ratio of the two Boltzmann factor, which is uh, this term of exponential of minus beta delta e here. Yeah, to be uh, to be more precise, you're right. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, t equilibrium is the time where you don't, you don't look at data before. You let the simulations run, but you don't look at the data, you don't store anything, you don't compute anything. Uh, and so that's equilibration. That's what you need to reach a steady state. And then T total, between T equilibrium and T total, that's where you measure your quantities. And that's where you, you measure uh, uh, monetization and everything. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's because if it's less than t total, uh, for all the time between t equilibrium and t total, you measure the quantities. So as t total is the final time of your Monte Carlo. That's when you stop uh, simulations. And t equilibrium is when you have reached thermalization. You mean why don't measure things before that? Mm -hmm. Ah, you mean this? Why this is on the left and not on the right? Uh, this is because here you are just storing data. So you, uh, you want to have all of the data available before making the average. That's, that's all. Yeah, because you... So you see, this is, for example, uh, 100,000, and this is 1 million. So you have... Not exactly, but you have uh, several tens of thousands. Exactly. Because this is, that's a very good point I should have insisted. Monte Carlo is about statistical average. So you really take a bunch of data, like uh, thousands or millions of them, and that you measure between equilibrium and total time. And with all of this uh, data, at the end, you do the average. And that's what Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is really a statistical average. So that's, what, that's a very good point. I should have said that. Carlo, you wanted to say? So you first take measurement after you reach the equilibrium time. Yeah. How can you decide? Is it possible, for example, from the acceptance ratio? I mean that you have some, yeah, I accept, 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 and then you start to, 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 to decide that, yes, I have reached the, probably I have reached the equilibrium time. Uh, so if you want to do it properly, what you do is that you compute the autocorrelation function. And if you do compute the autocorrelation, once you have decorrelated and you wait a little bit longer, then you have really decorrelated from the initial state, and you can assume that the decorrelation has brought you to a state which is thermalized at the right temperatures. In, so that's a proper serious way to do it. In practice, what is, what is useful is, um, well, with experience, you know that, uh, so personally I know that for normal systems, uh, even frustrated ones, after 100 Monte Carlo or a million Monte Carlo steps, the system is thermalized. But if you have a doubt, you can do it with, what I do then, I do simulations, the same uh, total, so same measurement time, but different equilibration times, and I see if my data changes or not. So that, in practice, that's, that's also a different way, another way. Uh, the acceptance ratio is a bit tricky because um, if you're at high temperature, the, you will not have a very, diff, a very different acceptance ratio between, uh, between the beginning and the end. Okay. Yes? Uh, 
so stochastic time, that's this. This is stochastic time in the sense of uh, uh, just take a, take a spin at random and try to flip it at random with this uh, process. Because this here, it respects detail balance. So it is a good way to uh, explore the Gibbs ensemble and to go from one state to another state which uh, respect the Boltzmann factor, and so which are physical at a given temperature. But it has actually, in practice, a priori, it has nothing to do with real time. It's just um, you take a spin and you check if you can flip it or not. So it is not completely unphysical because you can imagine that in your system, experimentally, you have a little spin and your spin has a, has a barrier, like an energy barrier, and with thermal fluctuations, using the Boltzmann weight, you can use, uh, you, you may have enough thermal fluctuations to pass over this barrier. So that's what you simulate here. But you are ignoring the fact that sometimes spins can have collective behavior, that sometimes two spins can move next to each other and that can, uh, so they can change things. And so this time is uh, not unphysical. And actually in, in some cases for some materials, it is a physical time, but it's, uh, it has not been defined to represent uh, like real time. So that's why it's stochastic, as opposed to real time, which uh, are defined for example in block equations, which I might have the time to talk about. Uh, okay, continue. Feel free to uh, to interrupt me, ask questions. Yeah. Uh, for example. Uh, so for this, it is by experience because I've done uh, thousands of simulations and typically that's a good time scale. But uh, so to be sure for a given system that you don't know, because sometimes it doesn't work, you do simulations. If your data you get at the end are a bit noisy, for example, uh, if your magnetization, like imagine, so for people online, I'm plotting uh, magnetization as a function of temperature for Ising system. So you get this and shoop. You get something roughly like this, okay? That's uh, magnetization for Ising system. Now, if your simulations do something like this, you know that your simulations are not properly thermalized. So you know that you need to go to, uh, so if your simulations are very noisy uh, and don't follow like a smooth curve, you know the simulations are probably not thermalized and so you want to push it further. And that's, that's usually what, what I see. I mean, uh, sometimes if I do for small, time, I will do something a bit noisy. If I increase the time, that means that we'll have more and more data points. I will have a better and better statistics. Central limit theorem tells me that the error bars and so the, these fluctuations scale like one over square root of uh, time, of Monte Carlo time. And so the errors of my data will be smaller and smaller and smaller, and I will get closer and closer to a smooth curve. So that's, uh, in practice, that's how you, you know if you need to increase the time or not. Okay, very good. Uh, now, let's move to some, uh, now I'm going to give you a few examples of a few algorithms uh, that are very useful. And the first one is parallel tapering. Parallel tapering is not the most trivial one because that, uh, that uses, um, well, parallelization. So you need to code, uh, to have your code uh, talking to different cores in your, in your simulations, but it's, it's brute force very efficient. I mean, people use it for spin glasses, so it's really useful to have it in your code. So imagine you have a system and you have a hot temperature and a cold temperature. What you do in your simulations is that, and you have access to a, high, to a supercomputer, a supercomputer and say you have a hundred cores, like a hundred computers in parallel, and each computer will be a different temperature, like this, tac, 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 okay? Now you can run your system in parallel like this, giving a different temperature at each computer. And at the end of Monte Carlo time, you, uh, so, uh, you get different data corresponding to different temperature and you get the nice curve like this, okay? So the, this means that uh, you don't need to have to run the, temp the temperatures one after the other, you can do it in parallel. So this is usually called something which is embarrassingly parallel uh, by, compu by computer scientists. And usually the IT people in your department will uh, scream at you and, uh, if you do that. Uh, so you don't tell them you're really doing that. Uh, uh, and actually nowadays people try to create pleasantly parallel to make it less negative. But essentially it means you use parallel jobs just to make it faster because if you have uh, n computers, you can be n times faster. 
Neuropilot tampering, what it does is that it uses uh, the fact that you have jobs in parallel and it lets things communicate between them. And so as you move along Monte Carlo time, so this arrow here is Monte Carlo time, okay? This is Monte Carlo time. As you move along, between temperature one and two, at some point, you will let the two cores talk to each other. So here it's, for example, temperature of one Kelvin and temperature of two Kelvin, and you let them talk to each other. Same thing between three and four Kelvin, five and six Kelvin, and so on. And then a little bit further, you let between two and three, and uh, four and five, and so on. This is just to make sure that after enough Monte Carlo time, all of the temperatures have been able to talk to each other. Okay? And by talking to each other, what you do is, you let, imagine you have a spin configuration starting here. You let it evolve at a temperature of one, two, three, four Kelvin. It evolves to four Kelvin. It talks to the one of three here, but it doesn't like it, so it doesn't go there. It continues, and then here, it talks to the one of five Kelvin. So you have two configurations, one at four Kelvin and one at five Kelvin. You compare them, you accept them with a given probability, which I'm going to talk about, and if uh, the probability is high enough, if it's accepted, you switch the two. So the configuration that was at four Kelvin goes to five, and the one at five Kelvin goes to four. And you continue. And so you see that if you do that, the four Kelvin goes to five, then to six, then come back to five, and so on. So I'm going to explain you how to calculate this in a moment. But physically, the idea is that was used in spin glasses. Because in spin glass, you get lots of thermalization problems. Systems get stuck. And so the idea, again, uh, motivated from experiments is if your system is stuck, you heat it up a little bit and then you cool it down and you get to new configurations and hopefully you have left a metastable state to reach a state of lower energy. Uh, so that's very common in spin glasses. And that's what you do here because imagine that your configurations here start at four, it's stuck here, you know, it's, uh, it's stuck in a, in a local minimum, in a metastable state, doesn't manage to, to leave and to do anything, it's frozen. Then you let, let heat, it, uh, heat it up to five, six, it could even go to seven, eight, and so on. And then you let it come back and say that after some time it goes back to four Kelvin, but then by letting it come back, it has left the metastable state because it has high energy to leave it. It leaves the metastable state and it goes into another state which might also be metastable or might be lower in energy or might be the ground state. And by doing that, you can explore the phase space. You can explore the Gibbs ensemble very efficiently and you don't get stuck at a given temperature, which would be what happens if you don't let the temperatures talk to each other. So, uh, again, I'm continuing, but yes. Uh, so, uh, you, for example, if you, so autocorrelation. If you calculate, so if you want to know for sure, you calculate autocorrelation, and if it's stuck, stuck like this, you, you know that you, you, you cannot. That's, for example, that's a very common uh, quantity for spin glasses. And then there, is, there has been lots of literature about uh, the evolution of autocorrelation in spin glasses. So then what you want, you, because the thing is, you still want to uh, you, uh, impose detail balance. You want detail balance. And so, but now you need to be a bit careful because your states are two states at two different temperatures. So blue is low temperature and red is high temperature, okay? Just, uh, so imagine you start from a state I at low temperature and J at high temperature and you want to mix them. Detail balance tells you that this, when you take the ratio of the probability between this and the reverse phenomenon, so J at low temperature and I at high temperature and you reverse them, so, okay. Uh, this can be written, big, you can say that the probability will be independent, uh, can be uh, deconnected. So what I mean is that the, the probability, here you can see it as a probability from state I at temperature T, to go to state J at temperature T. And same thing here, state J at temperature T to go to state I. And this is the blue quantity here. The, and then you can do it at same thing at, uh, at temperature T prime, and this is the red quantity. So here, between the first line and the second line, you're just uh, separating uh, low temperature and high temperature, okay? And then once you have that, you can use detail balance, and you can put the, Bolt, the ratio of Boltzmann weight, and you can compute it, and you get this formula, which is Honestly, it's pretty simple for such a complicated phenomenon. Yes? In what kind of situations this uh, detail balance condition might, might not work? So, uh, so the way to see it is, uh, you mean, it doesn't work in the sense that it doesn't thermalize the system or in the sense that you use a Monte Carlo that does not respect it? Yes, I mean, 
not just in this case even in the previous case that uh, at the same temperature for the same temperature you showed that one detail balance condition yeah so the thing is um so the for Monte Carlo simulations and for all of the Monte Carlo simulations that I have coded personally and that you will see in the literature almost all of them detail balance will always be imposed so it uh, it works in the sense you will always impose detail balance now there are some algorithm that breaks detail balance because um, detail balance can be stuck. Uh, so you, you might have difficulty to thermalize. And so one example is two-dimensional liquid solid phase transition. So you, you take a box, like a square, you put some hard disk, and you increase the density of this disk. Of this disk. And what happens physically is that you have a liquid phase, then you have an exotic phase you have, where you have a, a broken rotation, and then you have a solid phase uh, or um, floating solid phase uh well solid phase uh where the, you have a quasi long range order and to see the exact phase between the two that's extremely difficult because as you increase the the density to really thermalize the system will take you ages uh, super long and so people have developed a code that breaks detail balance to be able to uh, thermalize the system and so as a little uh, history fact this problem is the initial problem that was studied by metropolis and co-authors in 1953 and this was properly solved by Monte Carlo simulations 60 years later in 2010. De breaking data balance. Yes. Like, like every numerical method, does Monte Carlo also suffer around the uh, critical point? Uh, it, it can, because you have a critical slowing down. So it can suffer. Um, then if you want to study critical points, especially for Ising spins, you have lots of uh, like cluster algorithm, like Swenson Wang or Wolf algorithm is even better. Um, then for Ising spins, if you have a first order transition, you have the Wang Lando algorithm, which is pretty good. Uh, but that's mostly for, uh, for Ising spins. For continuous ones, uh, parallel tapering, if the transition is not first order, if it's continuous transition, parallel tapering is very good. I mean, in general, if it's not first order, parallel tapering is very good for any kind of things. And it, uh, it uh, usually helps a lot for the critical slowing down. You can have some pathological system, but it's usually pretty nice. Then if you have a strongly first order transition, that's a different story and you might need to think harder. Yes? So apply Monte Carlo to non-ergodic systems? Uh, yes. So you just need to be sure that the dynamics you use will stay non-ergodic. Because you see the, the, the steps here, this single spin flip. If the single spin flip is ergodic, because you will always, you can try any of the two to the n possibilities. If you don't want that, you just need to make sure that your dynamical uh, update, your small update, will not explore a phase space that you don't want to see. It, uh, it actually happens sometimes. Uh, I might talk about it. I have 20 minutes. Well, I can tell you I will not go to the end of my uh, lecture, but, uh, but please continue to, uh, uh, please continue. I mean, uh, I'm happy, I'm here for two weeks, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk later. Um, so about parallel tapering. So the thing is, so to come back to your question, uh, the thing is, when does it fail or not? Uh, imagine you have a temperature, like a low temperature, and this is uh, the quantity, like this is the energy. So at a given temperature, this is the uh, average energy. This uh, dashed line gives you the average energy. And this is a Gaussian distribution of the energy because you are in a canonical ensemble. So macro-canonical, you will be stuck at a given energy, but canonical, you have a Gaussian distribution of energy, okay? Uh, now, imagine that you consider a, top, a higher temperature, and you will have the same Gaussian. Usually it's a little bit higher because it's higher temperature, but you have a Gaussian. Now, if, the, if you use these two temperature, like T1, this is one Kelvin, this is two Kelvin, they will not talk to each other because you see the states, the energy that you have here, do not overlap with these ones. So what you do is that in your simulations, you have to be sure that your temperatures are close enough to have an overlap between them. And then once you have an overlap, then they can then, the states from this low temperature, these ones can go to this, and these ones can go to this one. And then this, essentially, this probability will be big enough to have some passage from one state to the, to the next. 
And usually, you want to try to have this temperature even closer to have an even bigger uh, overlap between them. And how to know that? You can check the acceptance ratio. If you check the acceptance ratio of this, if it's close to zero, it means pilot tapering doesn't work. If it's higher, it will, it will work. Uh, uh, so, difficulties, the width, this Gaussian width, depends on system size. When you increase system size, it goes like one over square root of n. So, which means that for a given, for given simulation to given system size, it might work, but if you increase the system size, the width will get lower and smaller and smaller, and you might, you will lose some of the overlap. So that's why when you do use pilot tapering for bigger systems, you need to close the temperature uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, then, first order transition. If you have a jump between these two, you can do whatever you want, they will not talk to each other. So if it's a weakly first order transition, it's fine. If it's a strong one, it will, uh, pilot tapering will essentially, um, thermalize things above the transition. It will, it might also work below the transition, but it will not work a uh, bit uh, above the transition. So strongly first order transition are not very good for pilot tapering. And also multiple transitions, even if actually that's usually not a problem. I mean, I have, I have simulated problems with like three transitions, one after the other, and pilot tapering was working very well. So as long as the transitions are not mean, basically, if they're not too discontinuous, that would be okay. Uh, well, actually, uh, actually, I might, well, I don't know, I might make it, so, yeah. Um, now, topological phase transitions with warm algorithm. The pilot tapering, that's really a brute force technique. You, you, honestly, if you do Monte Carlo simulations, it's a good idea to spend some time, a few days, a week or so on, to manage that and to code it, because you will use it very often. Uh, warm algorithm that really depends on the system. I'm talking here about because I think it's pretty nice. And also it's a connection to quantum Monte Carlo because warm algorithm was, is used a lot in quantum Monte Carlo. And here I'm going to show you a version of it in classical one, but the underlying physics is very similar. So if you understand that, you can understand some of the aspect of quantum Monte Carlo too. And for that, I need to introduce a bit spin ice. I'm not going to go into details. I mean, uh, but just to give you the basics. Spin ice uh, is a model that describes some of these rare earth power claw uh, system, dispersion titanate, homium titanate, and so on. It's on the three dimensional power claw lattice, and it's with Ising spins. Ising spins are nice because when you have, for a given tetrahedron, you have four Ising spins, so you have two to the four 16 states, and these are the 16 states of spin ice for tetrahedron. Uh, here I'm going to focus on the ground state, which are these six ones, and as a matter of fact, you see that the ground state is highly degenerate. And it actually, it's so that's the thing that when you cool down spin ice, spin ice model does not order and you still have an extensively degenerate state. And you have a residual entropy and so on. That's what makes the physics of spin ice interesting. But what I'm going to do here to study a topological phase transition, it's let's say we are stuck in the ground state. So the ground state is described by two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out. So that's the blue arrows and the red arrows. It's two in, two out. And then you put a magnetic field. Without the magnetic field, the six states are degenerate. With the magnetic field, of course, you favor the states which point up. Then you have the four states with zero magnetization. And then you have the states with spins pointing down. And so a magnetic field, you will want all of the spins pointing up. Now, uh, the thing is, if you were to do Monte Carlo for spin ice, that's easy. You just do single spin flip and that should work. The problem is, if you do single spin flip, if you flip one of these spins here, you see that uh, you will get three in, one out, which is an excited state. So you cannot flip a spin because that will make you leave the twin to out and you want to stay within the twin to out because the twin to out is essentially, it's a Coulomb gauge field. It's, uh, so it corresponds to, uh, it's described by the gauge field theory. And so it has some interesting long range algebraic properties. So it's a good place to look at topological phase transitions. But to look at these topological phase transitions, you want to stay in this ground state. So you, want, you don't want excitations, you want to stay there, and you want to study what happens when you put a magnetic field in this ground state. So you, do, you cannot have single spin flip. So you need some new kind of uh, algorithm. And to do that, to build it, let's temporarily, so really temporarily, flip a spin. This is the spread spin here. I create two topological defects next to it. So you see, all of these are two in, two out, and this one is 
one, two, three in and one out. And this one is one in and one, two, three out. Is it, is it okay? You tell me if I'm going too fast. But uh, right now, you just need to understand two in, two out is what we want. Three in, three in one out, three out, one in is what we do not want. But so temporarily, we flip this spin, and then you flip the next one. And then you use periodic bonding conditions to go through the system and come back from the top. And then you annihilate it. And you see that by doing this, you have, it's a very common thing that we see in first elementism. You have locally created a pair of topological charge, which in this case are gauge charges, and which in this case are actually magnetic monopoles. They were the magnetic monopoles of spin ice. So you have created a pair of topological charge with a plus and minus sign. You let them move around, and then they make a loop, they come back and they annihilate each other. And by doing this, you have temporarily created and, uh, charges, you have annihilated them, so you go back to the uh, Coulomb gauge field phase that you want, but you have updated a whole loop of spins. So you have been able to update the system and to create some dynamics while respecting this constraint of two in, two out. And this is the kind of, this is the kind of move that we need. So you see it's not a local one, it's a non-local one, but this is what we need to describe this topological phase, this gauge field theory. And this loop algorithm, the problem is, with automatic field, it's fine. You can just create a loop, and it costs no energy because everything is degenerate. But when you have a magnetic field, you see that a string going from top to bottom of spins pointing down, that has an extensive energy cost. The, it has an energy cost that scales with the size of the system. So if you do that, and you put a metropolis argument, it will almost always be rejected because it's a huge energy cost. So you cannot use that simply to thermalize your system. So you need to develop, so you need to develop a directed warm algorithm. So just for the sake of uh, terminology, when you create a loop like this, this is uh, a warm algorithm, a loop algorithm, depending on people, they use both names. And now I'm going to teach you about directed warm algorithm, which is to create this loop and to accept it at the end, automatically. Yes? Uh, yes. So that's uh, along, along this axis. Uh, along, that's a vertical one. Uh, zero, zero, 001, that's uh, Z axis. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I didn't understand the same question. The global uh, Z axis. So it's a global one like this. So all of the spins see the same field. The, the, yeah. Okay. So uh, to explain to you what we do, Monte Carlo in 1949, it was choose the configuration and give it Boltzmann weight. That was very inefficient. The idea of Metropolis and co-authors was to accept a configuration with probability exponential of minus beta e. But, so that was much better, and that's what I explained before. But still, there is a notion of acceptance, which means if you have acceptance, you can have rejection. And so that means that uh, you, have, you lose something. So you, you do some calculations, and in the end, they don't lead to anything because you don't update anything. And now what I'm going to tell you is how to build a configuration with the probability of the Boltzmann factor, which means it will automatically be accepted at the end. So that's a rejection-free algorithm, almost. Nothing is too, too good to be true. Let us consider two spin configurations, so two states I and G, printed by a loop. So you see you have a spin, you have a spin I state, and you have like a big red loop like this, or you have a small blue loop like this. So state I is with a loop pointing down, and state J is with a loop pointing up, for example. This is the quantity I was talking about, the transition rate and the detail balance. You want to impose this detail balance. Now, this is the ratio of probabilities between state I and J. So this is to go from state J to I over this one. And so what you do by creating the loop, you decompose this probability step by step. So for each step of the loop, you say, I'm starting from state J, uh, so actually, this one, we take the bottom. I'm starting from state i, and I flip the spin between, i. Uh, I go the loop between spin uh, one and two, then between spin two and three, and three and four, four and five, and so on, until spin n minus one and n, for a loop of length n, okay? And then the reverse move of your algorithm, this is to go from state i to state j. The denominator is this. Uh, now, if you want to go from state J to state I, you start from state J and you do the reverse loop. You start from N, which is actually this next, just next to one because it's a closed loop. 
n to n minus 1 and so on, and you close it. And this is, should be equal to the ratio of Boltzmann factor. And same thing, the Boltzmann factor, it's an energy. So the energy is the sum of the energy of each atroid one. Because between state i and j, everything is the same except for the loop. So you can simplify the Boltzmann factor by eliminating all the spins which are not in the loop. And then you only look at the spins along the loop. And you, and you can decompose it as a sum of each spin or each state right one. You see, what I, you see what I'm doing here? This is, OK. OK. Uh, and then, once you have this, you can decompose this. And in particular, to go from state, uh, so spin 1 to 2 from state j, j, i, and from state j from 2 to 1. So you see, you put all of these probabilities 2 by 2, and you make them correspond to the energy difference. Because here, the idea is simply, instead of having a global detail balance, you decompose the detail balance step by step for each step of the construction of the loop. And you can look at each tetrahedron. one. This is possible because the probability is an exponential of energy. Your energy is a sum of terms, which means it's a product of exponential. And so that's why you have this product of exponential and you have a product of probabilities. And that's why you can impose the detail balance. You can decompose it by imposing the detail balance for each tetrahedron. one. And the way you do it is that when you construct the loop, instead, you see, when you have, because it's two in, two out, when you enter a tetrahedron, you always have two possibilities to go out, uh, because it's two in, two out. And the random worm, you will have probability 50-50 to go right or left, yeah, right or left. Uh, now, with this, you will have a given probability that respect local detail balance. So that's the thing, that respect this local detail balance. So you see this one equal to this for spin i and 2, this one equals to this for spin 3 and 2, and so on. So if, as you construct the loop, you choose a probability between left and right with a given probability that respect this local detail balance, at the end of the day, when you close the loop, you have respected and imposed the detail balance over the whole loop construction. And so by doing this, you have imposed this equal to the ratio of the Boltzmann uh, factor, and this is equal. And so you have imposed the detail balance between those two states, i and j. And that means you can just close the loop and accept it. So you see the importance of that, because even for a system where excitations might have an extensive energy cost, you can still construct them and respect detail balance. And that's how you can thermalize the system. Now, how to do the calculations? You know the Boltzmann weight, because this is just coming from the energy difference. Uh, technical point, you see it's minus 4h plus 4h, it's minus 2h two plus 2h. That's because each spin belongs to two tetrahedra. So if you, uh, if you need to divide by two, because you have the energy coming from tetrahedra on the left and tetrahedra on the, on the right. It's, if you don't, if you put 4h, you will do double counting of the spins. That's all. It's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm saying this because I spent one month when I was a PhD student realizing that. So just to spare you one month. Um, and then, so you know that. And so now what you can use is uh, probabilities. And because you know that when you enter a tetrahedron, one, the, the, prob the sum of probabilities to exit it must be one. You can, the sum of probabilities is one. That's what, that's, uh, that's what you want. And so probability equals to one. So if you impose the local detail balance, P is equal to transition weight divided by the weight W. And so the weight alpha of a given state is equal to the sum of the transition weight. And that's what we have here for the four different possibilities. So if I am in, in a state like this, in the high energy state, when I enter the tetrahedron, any time I leave it, I will go to a state of zero energy. So I have these two possibilities. When I am in this state, when I enter the state of lowest energy, when I enter it, I will always also go to a state of zero energy. So I have also these two possibilities for the uh, ground state. So this is the first line in the ground state. The last line is the excited state. And then for these ones, depending when I enter, if I did this way or this way, I will go towards the, excit the excited state or towards the ground state. So that's why I have two different possibilities. And these four equations, are the four uh, possibilities I have when I enter uh, the tetrahedron. First, I look, what is the initial configuration? Is it excited, zero energy, or ground state? 
And then I look, when I exit, what is going to be the next state? Is it excited, zero energy, or ground state? And these are the four possibilities you have. Uh, I mean, it's really nothing magical. You just have to, uh, to count, and that's, that's actually very simple. Uh, now you impose local detail balance, and local detail balance tells you that, uh, well, these two will be equals, and these two will be equals too, because transition rate from up, from ground state to zero, should be the same transition rate from zero to up. So these are the same. Because you see here, you have four equations, but you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, yeah, you have six variables. So it's unconstrained. You want to optimize, and so this is where the algorithm comes from, the optimization comes from. You, it's under constraint, so you have some freedom to uh, modify, the, you have some freedom to impose, such that your algorithm will be as efficient as possible. And here the, uh, well, actually, hmm, I'm sorry, I take that back, that's for the that's for our next case. For this one, you don't, because you have these six possibilities, you impose local little balance, which is the physical rule that you want to impose. And once you have that, you have four variables, four equations, four variables, you can solve it, and you get the probabilities, knowing that the probabilities are always uh, transition rate divided by the weight, okay? The weight are known, the ratio of the weight are known, and the transition weight, you can just explain them as a function of weight, and this is what you get. So these are, so here, for example, if you start from uh, excited state, uh, uh, well, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Uh, if you start, yeah, if you start from uh, ground state, the probability to go to a state of energy zero is one half. And if you start from a state uh, zero, the probability to go to, to another state of energy zero is this, or the probability to go to a state of ground state is this one here, okay? This, so when you enter a tetrahedron, one, if you impose these probabilities, this is what you get. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that you see that these probabilities, they should always be between zero and one. And you see that this one might have an issue because if you impose one minus one half of W, uh, up, let's call it up, let's call it up, of a W zero. Uh, if you want this to be uh, above zero, that's equivalent to uh, t -t 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 W up of a W zero uh, smaller than two, okay? And W up of a W zero, you know it's exponential of two beta H smaller than two. And so that means, if you take the logarithm, uh, t bigger than 2h over logarithm of 2. And so that means that these probabilities are valid for temperature higher than 2h over log 2. When you are below that, what you need to do is to allow for backscattering. So when you, when you loop move, it doesn't have two possibilities, but a third one to come back behind. Physically, that's really what happens. When you are at high temperature, you look can, your worm can always move around. That means you can always, uh, uh, I'm going to finish soon. You can always move, move further and uh, um, decorate the system. Now, if you're at lower temperature, it's not necessarily always possible. And so you need to allow backscattering. And so it's really kind of search and destroy algorithm. Like you warm up, move forward, it's stuck, so it comes back, and then it tries another way to another to close. And that's why it's so efficient. But then when you do that, then you can solve the system and you get this whole set of probabilities and above, above TK and below TK. And once you impose these probabilities in your one construction, you can calculate the magnetization as a function of temperature and you get the red curve with a kink here. So that's a Cassian transition, which is sometimes called a, a transition free half because it's, it's continuous, like a second order, but there is a sharp discontinuity, a sharp kink, like a first order one. So that's, uh, that's sometimes is called free half. And this algorithm is very efficient because you can simulate system up to 30, 32 million of spins. And you can uh, calculate quantities up to seven or eight orders of magnitude of the mutation. And you can get the position and the logarithmic uh, financial scaling up to this kind of order. 
And you can even play further and allow for uh, topological defects. And if you allow for topological defects, what happens is that your, your worm is moving forward. It hits the topological defects. And then you can do a wormhole and move the topological defect to the beginning of the worm. This has a small energy cost, which you can accept or not by a small metropolis ar uh, argument. But once you do that, you can uh, also include topological defects in your simulations. And by doing that, you can do simulations at finite temperature as in experiments. And you can compare your data with experimental data up to a rescaling of the transition of the, temp of the temperature. As I said, Monte Carlo simulations usually need a rescaling of the transition temperature. But you have a very nice match between the two simulations and the exponential data, which are the black dots for this presentation. And I think I've gone through, I've uh, finished, uh, yeah, this is uh, the end. So uh, I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions or anything, I'm very happy to answer. And I'm here for one more week. So feel free to, uh, to come to me. Thank you. No, does it work? Yeah. Oh, it work. Thanks. Okay, so, yes, Harald. Um, can you explain um, where this rescaling of the temperature comes from? What, how to understand that? Um, it, so, it can have many different origins. So, for example, in the urban titanate that I was showing in the beginning, I think it comes mostly because I was using parameters that were derived from quantum calculations, and I was using them for classical simulations. And so that, uh, and so naturally, you can have, you will have some uh, rescaling, and that's probably why I need it. Then there is a thing which is complicated, which is, for the spin one half, uh, classical simulations will give you s squared equal one quarter, while quantum simulation will give you s times s plus one equals three quarter. So right there, you have a factor of three between the classical and the quantum simulations. Here in this case, that's this point It's really an Ising system. So I think the rescaling is mostly coming because this is uh, simulations for nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, and we know that dipole interactions are important. So here in this case, I don't think it's really an issue of the uh, classicalness of Monte Carlo, because actually it's worked pretty well for this material. But I think it's because the model is a bit too simple and I need to include, I would need to include dipole interactions. More questions? And to conclude on your question, uh, of course, there is a fact of uh, quantum melting. So in the system, even if it's a large spin, there might be some quantum melting, and this quantum melting will lower the other parameter and might also shift the transition temperature a bit. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, it doesn't work, right? Or does it? Okay. So you mentioned that the only problem essentially that we have if we are looking at a classical system is thermalization, and you mentioned that you can see the thermalization, whether there's a problem with thermalization by looking at fluctuations in your observables. So is there, there's never any case where it just fails silently, where it just, I don't know, converges to wrong results or? Uh, well, it's not, um, no, it, it can happen. For example, I mean, spin glasses, if you, that's a big question of how to thermalize spin glasses in simulations. That's a huge thing, which has, you have had work over like past 30, 40 years. Uh, then in our system, to be honest, in most cases, uh, if you spend enough time, like uh, I haven't showed all, all of the things, but if you use, for example, for classical spins, you use heat bath algorithm, parallel tapering, overall relaxation, uh, that's going to thermalize all, almost all of the system. I have met a few really pathological ones. That's when you have a very sharp, strong first order transition. So parallel tapering uh, is out of the way and you have long range order at a finite large Q vector or small Q vector, which means you don't have like a, uh, just like a, the four spins of a tetrahedron one which uh, map, but you need to use a, a cubic unit cell of 16 sites or sometimes even a 32 ones. And then if you use local algorithm of Monte Carlo and with a sharp first order transition, it might be very tricky to simulate. But uh, so I have one, I have, there have been one model where it was very difficult and we collaborated with people in machine learning to try to really look at the fine details of the data. But even in that case, if you are very patient and you, uh, for example, what happens is that for small, because on top of that you have order by disorder. So for small system, order by disorder will select a given Q vector. But if you increase system size, you can see that the Q, bright peaks of uh, say Q equal X will decrease 
why the white peaks of Q equals W will increase. And then you can do some finance scaling and you can still see the long range order. So you need to be very careful, very patient, but in almost all of the cases, it's possible to solve it. Okay, thank you. Any, any more questions? Can you pass down the mic, please? So in the beginning, you were showing some comparisons between spin wave analysis mm -hmm. and classical Monte Carlo. And I am not sure if I understand it correctly, but you were saying that um, we have some quantum up to linear order results from classical Monte Carlo. Um, am I understanding it correctly? Uh, yes. Uh, so the point is you need to add one more ingredient, which is... Uh... As soon as you see this, so that was the. Uh, so the point is, if you have this kind of Hamiltonian, so the, it's a complicated, so it's uh, matrix interaction, so as, as isotopic as you want, between as many spins as you want, plus a magnetic field which can vary from side to side. The point is, you can always re rewrite it as a, as a sum of term of a local molecular field on a given spin S. This, uh, you, you can say, is as complicated as you want, you can always write it this way. And then the local molecular field is a function of the other spins, but it will like, be like this. And then when you have something like this, this can be seen as a kind of Larmor precession, uh, kind of, with all of the parentheses, I can put. Um, and then you can write some semi-classical dynamics represented by the nonlinear block equations, which are like this. And then you can see that all of your spin S uh, dynamically, and this is the real time. So this is not stochastic time, but this is the real time of a spin S uh, at position K that fills a given magnetic field BK. And this is a semi-classical dynamics. So that's through this term that you can add some, some degree of quantum fluctuations up to linear order. So the way it works is you do Monte Carlo simulations at a given temperature. You have a, like a thousand, a ten, hundred, or thousand spin configurations. And each of these spin configurations, you let them evolve respecting these block equations for each of the spin. So to do that, you use Runge-Kutta method, typically up to fourth order, that's usually good enough. Uh, I have a colleague, Mathieu Taifumier, who does that up to eighth order. So it's really precise. The energy does not move by a factor of uh, 10 to the eight, but uh, it takes a long time. But, uh, Usually, this fourth order is enough. And this looks complicated, but it's not very difficult to implement. And then you have the real time dynamics of your Monte Carlo simulations. And then, if you do Fourier transform in uh, time space, you get the inelastic data in, uh, in energy in omega space. And you can compare these results with inelastic neutron scattering measurements. Uh, yes. And uh, actually, that's a, thank you for the question. That's an important point. If you're interested in this, I really, really recommend you to look at this paper and in particular the supplementary materials of this paper because they really give you all the technical details on how to do uh, this Wunschkuta method, especially what is the time step you want, what is the uh, system size you want. And it discusses the comparison between classical and quantum. In particular, usually you need to multiply by beta omega for that and they explain, and they explain what. But uh, when you do that, you uh, well, I will just run this uh, simulation if there are no other questions. Uh, Thank you. Background. Okay, I, I think we're 10 minutes late um, okay. and um, you guys can ask the questions. But before we finish, oh. let me ask if there's any online questions because those guys can't ask in the coffee break. Do we have any, anyone among the online people? Please unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, I think we don't have any, any further questions. So let's uh, thank uh, Ludovic one more time for this wonderful tutorial. And we are going to meet here uh, at 11.30 for uh, Philip's uh, tutorial on tensor networks. Sorry, I mean, at some point it will start. But, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. So this is what you can do with... Um... So... Okay, just to uh, uh, 
feel free to go and have tea and so forth. But uh, this is so this was done by Rico Polo, Nick Shannon, and uh, um, a very uh, very competent guy at, at IT, uh, Pavel, um, who used Monte Carlo simulations and this molecular dynamics. And then they gave the data to Pavel, who uh, used some powerful video software to represent them in real space. And here it's physically very interesting because they, when you do the inelastic, uh, when you do the inelastic uh, scattering, you can decompose the inelastic data into three different uh, bands, so dispersive bands or flat bands. And when you decompose them, you can see that some of the spins of some of the bands behave uh, have very fast fluctuations that you have here, while some others would have intermediate ones and some others were slow ones. So it was a very good way to see that each band correspond to a given time scale of fluctuations and with a, with a beautiful uh, representation from, from this guy. So Pavel, Pavel Pushenkov, he's the one from scientific computing. Thank you very much. Thank you.